Great. So um, we're going to get started because we've only got an hour and we've got five fantastic panellists that we want to um, talk to this afternoon. So uh, welcome everybody um, to this webinar. It's um, about social enterprises and retailers as campaigners. And we've got five fantastic um, social enterprises and, and campaigners with us today. Um, and one of the one of the important things that we're, we're going to think about, obviously, this is a Social Enterprise UK webinar. It's an eBay for Change webinar. Um, we think about campaigners not necessarily um, from a point of view of running a social enterprise. So I'm going to uh, go around the room and basically ask people um, why social enterprise? What, how, what, what made you think that, that social enterprise as a business model was the best way for you to um, do your campaigning? So tell us a little bit about what you do, what your enterprise does, uh, and why the campaigning fits in with that. Um, I'm going to start with Claire. Thanks, Joanna. Um, yeah, so I'm Claire Donovan, and I'm the Head of Research Policy and Campaigns at End Furniture Poverty, uh, which is the campaigning arm of a group of registered charities and social enterprises known as FRC Group. So within that, we've got Furniture Resource Centre, which sells new furniture to local authorities, social landlords across the UK. And we've got Bulky Bobs, which is one of the largest furniture reuse charities uh, in the country. End Furniture Poverty sits very independently from that group. We're not here to drum up business for FRC or for Bulky Bobs. Um, we're here to raise awareness of the issue of furniture poverty and obviously campaign and lobby for change and carry out research to provide a solid evidence base for that change. Um, but it very, it's really helpful for us that we've got the broader organisation to draw on that experience and expertise of the staff across all the social businesses. Uh, and it also can give us some ins with some of their customers, which are some of the people that we want to speak to because they're people that, who we feel can do something about uh, end furniture poverty. So we're a bit different because, as I say, we're registered charities as well. And our charitable mission is to end furniture poverty. And we embed that across the whole organisation. Um, but, yeah, does that answer the question? <laughs> Yes, certainly. So uh, you've got the social enterprise, the charity and, and the campaigning and they yeah. all kind of feed into each other. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Karine, I'm going to come to you next. I don't know whether you consider yourself to be a campaigner, but you're certainly a, a social entrepreneur. Um, but you're, yeah, just tell us a little bit about uh, about what you do and, and why. Yeah, so I'm Corinne Bryant and I am founder of Butterfly Books and we um, create children's picture books that address um, bias, mainly gender bias in different professions. Um, and actually we, how it started was that I was, I don't know if you'd call this campaigning, but um, I was a STEM ambassador, so science, technology, engineering and maths. Um, I used to go into schools and talk about, um, so I'm an engineer, studied engineering, um, talk about what engineering is about, um, you know, and kind of address stereotypes of who can be an engineer um, and, and what the, the job involves. Um, and, and kind of the, the business started from that. So when I was going into schools, I realized that there was a huge problem with the misconceptions from a very young age and me just talking to them, um, you know, from the age of four um, and up, it, it was um, tricky to just use the, the resources that were already available. So the idea behind the children's books was a way to get that message across. Um, so that's how the business started. So I guess it started from kind of like a campaign and then became a business. Um, so after we did the first book, um, we were approached by other people in other industries that had the same problem and, and it rolled on from there. So I think the, the social enterprise approach was um, really fitting because it was all about making a social impact um, through the books. Yes, so I suppose you started as a campaigner and then the, the enterprise came out of, of, of what you were what you were trying yeah. to do with the... Uh, uh, with the STEM work, wonderful. Um, uh, Andy, I'm going to come to you next. Thank you. <laughs> I, I'm Andy Redburn, uh, and uh, we set up the uh, Green Heart Collective uh, just under two years ago. And uh, we did think long and hard about whether we should be a business, a social enterprise, or a charity. Uh, and initially, we did toy with the idea of becoming a charity, but realised that charity legislation. Uh, does actually make it hard uh, when you really want to campaign on an issue because there are rules around uh, political bias and uh, what you can do politically uh, if you are a registered charity. So in the end, we opted to become a, a social enterprise so that uh, we didn't have to worry about that. But we chose a social enterprise because we still wanted to be constrained by uh, what we believed in so that basically we didn't want it to be seen as just a yet another business kind of like jumping into the greenwashing space 
uh, we actually wanted to show that you know we had an asset lock in there was no dividends being paid out so the organization was set up to actually embody the very best of what a social enterprise could do but also be free to do what it wanted around trading and campaigning so do you want to tell us a little bit more about what your what the campaign is and how it fits in with with the Greenheart collective so our, our aim is to basically to keep waste from landfill and uh, initially when we started was in the middle of lockdown and basically we got a warehouse and opened up the door and said basically if it's going to landfill bring it to us and we'll try and buy the home for it um, and over the 18 months two years we've been doing that that's iterated so we've become a bit more focused we found other people who are working as specialists in other areas so we found you know, people who recycle bikes uh, people who work with furniture so some of the harder stuff we found actually we had great people already doing it but in the area particularly of clothing uh, homeware uh, fitness gear books there wasn't anybody doing it so we kind of made those our kind of key areas uh, about what we're doing so our aim is to put the, the news out amongst our communities that if you've got waste that is going to go to landfill and it's in those categories call us and we'll try and help you find a solution to that whether that's directly us or it's working with one of the many other organizations we're now kind of like aligned with yeah it sounds very similar to what claire's doing with the with the furniture so i think there's there's lots of synergies here and uh, so i'm going to move over to joe now now your, your organization is called where does it come from i'm guessing that's a clue as to what you do it's definitely a clue joanna thank you yeah hi everyone i'm joe salter i founded where does it come from in 2013 and um it's really it's, it, we call our strap line is kind clothes that tell tales and the idea behind it is that we're sharing the stories behind everything that we make. So um, we have uh, three pillars that we work to. We're trying to um, improve working conditions through fair trade models. We're trying to do things for the environment at the same time so that um, we're using the most eco processes and materials and also now moving over to more circular models but another key pillar is mental health as well because we believe that by people understanding a lot more about the impacts of the products that they're they're buying that actually affects our mental health because uh, connectivity gives you a, a deeper level of happiness basically so that's what we that's what we believe um, so we work with fair trade organizations around the world and social enterprises in the uk as well creating clothing and textile products which we sell retail and um, b2b as well so that's that's what we do there's quite a lot of um, campaigning in it as you can see i know one of the later topics is going to be around how do you balance out campaigning with making money basically being a business uh, similarly similarly to andy it was looking at the right model for us to be able to campaign but also make a difference and i i do believe that it's quite important to be able to make money if you want to change consumerism because it's all about consumerism um, so that's why i wanted to make it a social enterprise rather than a charity or um, and also i wanted to be able to create wealth for our artisan workers as well so it's about the impacts that we're having on our stakeholders and being a social enterprise makes that the best way to do it but just like Andy said we've also got the asset lock and all of that built in so that our principles are firmly embedded within the business um, social enterprise generally I don't need to tell anybody here I mean the, the, the main reason for going down this route is <laughs> Being and the current economic model re relying on growth and being being able to wanting to reward people for production and profitability is just leading us down a, a blind alley in terms of the ridiculous amounts of products being created, which are you know leading to harsh working conditions, low pay, environmental damage, etc., and ending up in landfill. So um, that's that's kind of why this model and why we're doing what we do. Um, the campaigning is also really important, and it's a interesting balance to keep keep going yeah great um so i'm going to move on next you've, you've already mentioned called consumerism um sean is um the founder of ethical hour and i know you you've uh, written a book quite recently um by better consume less so um essentially my, my question is about the the the, the businesses that are part of it there we go <laughs> okay. 
Thanks, Joe. <laughs> um, I should have kept my copy to one side as well. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, essentially the businesses that are part of Ethical Hour, um, how are they campaigning? How are you uh, campaigning through Ethical Hour? And what, uh, what do you feel that social en enterprises can do in this space? Mm, so thank you, Joanna. Thanks for the book plug, Joe. Um, so we're a membership organisation for ethical and sustainable um, independent businesses and challenger brands. And my background's in marketing and communications. So I've really studied kind of how greenwashing works and how we are sold all of this stuff. And we're in that consumption cycle. And so much of it is subconscious. Um, and the book is really about how we break those patterns as consumers. Um, and so a lot of the kind of individual campaigning that I do around kind of promoting the book and the message in that is that is at consumers around, you know, being more conscious and buying better, consuming less. But actually, the work that I do is is looking structurally that if the businesses change and we create a world, our mission at Ethical Hour is creating a world where every business is a force for good. And if we do that, then consumers won't need to worry about it. We won't need to unpick our subconscious habits that are so deeply ingrained in us because we will naturally be buying better consuming less and we'll all be on that mission so through ethical hour we provide a lot of training and support to those businesses to help them get their message out into the mainstream and to help them do their campaigning take their better alternatives out into big retailers and building up their profile as experts and leaders and campaigners as well. And then as a collective, we try to come together to contribute to campaigns where having a collective voice makes us more powerful, because I think sometimes, you know, as small business owners, we're all very, very busy, aren't we? And, and it is finding that balance, like Joe said, between running your business, making the money you need to survive and thrive, and then getting yourself out there as a campaigner. So it's really looking for those opportunities where as a collective, we can do that. And sometimes that's leading by example and saying, this is what it looks like when you're not greenwashing, or this is what responsible production looks like. Um, and at other times, it's being very vocal and contributing to government consultations on things like greenwashing or fast fashion and its environmental impacts and things like that. That's great. Um, yeah, so the, the, the next thing I want to talk about is the, the challenges that we're facing. Um, I want to come back to Claire because uh, the campaign to end furniture poverty um that this is something that a lot of people don't really think of when they particularly when they think about poverty um so do you want to tell us a little bit more about um the, the challenges that you're facing and, and and why why the campaign's needed yeah i think you're spot on there i think the issue with furniture poverty is it is quite niche and obviously at the end of the day it's about poverty it's about people not having enough money to live on and obviously the top priorities are always going to be food and fuel but living without essential furniture items has a devastating impact on people's mental health, their physical health, their social and financial well-being. Um, you know, it has such a huge impact across every area of people's lives and there is limited support out there. So we've worked very hard to encourage social landlords to provide more furnished tenancies, to uh, lobby government for more funding for local welfare assistance schemes and then for local authorities to spend that money. We work a lot with grant giving charities and the, the reuse sector. But yeah, it is a it is a crowded marketplace. We've done a lot of work with the media this year. In fact, literally an hour ago, I was on the phone to Sky News talking about the household support fund. When I speak to journalists, it's like a, a light bulb goes on and they say, oh, God, yeah, of course, if you if you can't afford food, how on earth can you afford to replace a broken cooker? And we have had a lot of traction. You know, we've been we've been in The Guardian, The Mirror, The Express. I've been on Woman's Hour. We've got. Uh, BBC coming next week, but the one show coming in July. So, you know, part of that is because we're in such a bad way at the moment. We're in the midst of this, obviously, this awful cost of living crisis. And for journalists, sometimes they want a new angle and furniture does give them that new angle. But, you know, it's really important for us to try to get it onto that agenda um, in the right place. Um, so, yeah, we work very, very hard to do that. I think one of the other challenges for us is, you know, FRC Group is a big organisation. You know, we've been around since 1988. Turnover this year is about 70 million. Social value last year created was over 4 million, over 150 staff. And furniture poverty, there's just me at the moment. <laughs> My colleagues left and we're just recruiting at the moment. So we're a very small team. So sometimes within that sort of commercial mindset, although we do reinvest 100% of the profits back into the organization, sometimes we can be a little bit sort of forgotten about. But then on the other hand, I think that that ultimately is a positive because of that independence it's so vital that we retain that independence because 
I can't have a social landlord thinking the only reason I'm trying to support them to deliver a furnished tenancy scheme is so they'll buy the furniture from FLC. It'd be great if they did, but we don't expect them to do that. Um, so our remit is very much, you know, FLC had been doing all this work to get furniture to people on local levels for many, many years. And then Furniture Poverty is here to deliver scale solutions, national solutions, which we may have nothing to do with as an organisation when it comes to delivering them, um, which has been a change of change of mindset, I think, for a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, that, that's that's really important. Um, I'm going to move on to to, to Corinne. So what are the, what are you seeing as the biggest challenges within within your uh, either, either within engineering or with the, um, the social enterprise itself? Yeah, so um, as I said, it's all about, I guess, addressing biases in professions. And it started out with addressing biases in, in engineering and, and science and technology. Um, and what I, I find is, um, I guess, it's that there's a lot, there's a big, there's a huge problem and lots of small organisations trying to do things um, separately. Um, but it's difficult to kind of get everyone to come together to make a bigger, <laughs> bigger impact. Um, so I guess I guess that's one of the main challenges. Um, and in terms of Butterfly Books itself, you know, we're, we're kind of family run. Me and my brother uh, are the, um, run the business, and then we have people who are kind of subcontractors. So and and both of us work. Um, so I still work in engineering. My brother still works in, in his um, his job. So it's hard to scale as well and um, to to make that impact because because whatever you put in is what you get get out. So I guess that's a challenge for us is kind of scaling within the business and then also as a whole, um, trying to get people to, to collaborate. I and mean, we've had some, some big um, collaborations with some large, large organisations, but it's just that there's lots of people doing small, like about the size of us trying to do things. But I think if, if we were able to get people to come together, um, that would make a bigger impact. Yeah, that was something that came up in the last webinar I was in. Why can we work together? In particular, that was about sort of um, challenging the the Rwanda flight um, disaster. Um, but uh, but yeah, I think I think that's that's one of the key things with social enterprises. Is I always say that we're collaborative rather than competitive. So when we don't see each other as com competitors. Um, we, we can work together and it feels like this is an opportunity for for social enterprises to come together and, and try and achieve a broader change mm -hmm. um andy what are your what are your sen senses what are the the biggest challenges that are um facing green heart collective and uh, your campaigns i think our, our biggest challenge is actually something that we didn't think of at the start which was we assumed the fact that we were saving stuff from landfill would actually mean that the people who were donating stuff to us and were working with us would actually be on board with the idea of actually buying pre-loved items. And actually, what we're finding is that we're effectively a, can be seen as like a, a, a middle-class sop, that basically people who are worried about, you know, buying something new and they've got to throw something out, oh, well, I can give it to Greenheart Collective, that will make me feel better uh, because, oh, they're going to do something good with it. And sometimes I get into quite detailed discussions with people because people will phone up and say, I've got this amazing kind of like, you know, corner unit sofa and all this amazing leather furniture. And uh, I'm sure you could find somebody that wants it. And I go, no, nobody's going to want that. If somebody's living in a, a, a one bedroom flat with a tiny, a tiny lounge and they've got to get the sofa up a, up a tight flight of stairs, they're going to want a little two, two person sofa. They're not going to cope with that. And you are not going to come and buy from me. So why would I take it? Because you're the kind of person that buys us. And uh, that was kind of quite a harsh kind of reality for us, was recognising that actually our message is actually buy less and buy pre-loved. Um, it's actually not send you your shit um, because that's not much of a campaign when it gets down to it. And I think the other thing that's become absolutely fair to us is the, I don't want to wish the terrible NGO word, but, you know, the intersectionality of the kind of issues we're looking at, you know, the fact that the kind of people who really need the kind of products we have are the, 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 the poorest people in our community. So we're having to work with refugee charities to actually find a way of actually moving products for free to those people because they have no way of getting to us, they can't afford the bus fare. And so the kind of, our kind of campaigning is becoming almost like trying to get the, the, the kind of people who are donating to us to actually open their eyes to the reality of the world they live in. I mean, that example Claire gave about, you know, furniture poverty, 
you know, we had somebody contact us recently about a sofa. We had one sofa left and uh, we got to the house and literally it was the only piece of furniture in their living room was the sofa we took in for them. And uh, see the little boy who was there, his little face light up when he realized he could sit down to watch the telly, it was just amazing. And that, those are, that's what we want to get across is to people that you know, there are big issues to solve here and just don't just pass as your shit and hope that's going to solve everything. Yeah, I think this is one of the big problems with with, um, with pre-loved in general is that there's a sense that you're either a donator or a consumer um, and, and the people who give things to charity shops are not the same people that shop in charity shops. That's always been the case, but I think it's getting more, now there's more stuff in the world, it's becoming imperative for, for the rest of us to start buying uh, buying more pre-loved and, and not, not expecting everything to be brand new. Um, so. Um, yeah, Joe. what's the biggest challenge that, you, that you're facing at the moment? Um, well, firstly, I just want to say I really feel your pain, Andy. I used to run a pre-loved school uniform thing at my son's primary school, and it really used to be annoying how you'd try and get people to buy stuff. They'd get, they're happy to give you bags and bags and bags of their old gear, which was all filling up my house, and then they wouldn't actually buy anything new. They'd go off to the shop and buy it all brand new. It's ridiculous. Anyway, there you go. That's not answering the question, but it's very annoying. Um, so challenges for us. The message, I think, as we've already been talking about, is out there. It's loud and clear. So 10 years ago, people didn't really think about sustainability, fair trade impacts in the same way. But now it's in the press every day um, and talking about sustainability, climate emergency all the time. So there's, there's there's some really good things there. But the biggest challenge now I'm finding is how do you affect that behaviour change? Um, it's just what Andy was saying. So it's about, you know, how do you get people to realise that they can be part of this? How can they, how can they actually get involved and do things themselves rather than just wanting other other people to solve the problems but they carry on by themselves so I think education inspiring people all of that making a complex message simple enough to be heard in amongst all our marketing hype that people are getting and, the, and then usual way of going on um, is is part of the, the challenge that we have. One of the things that I do is run a podcast, it's a quick plug, the Where Does It Come From podcast. And part that the idea of that is to try and talk to people and get people to sort of understand, get a deeper understanding of some of the issues. So that's one, behavior change. Um, a key one for us is price expectations, um, which won't surprise you. So with fast fashion and everything going on um, around consumerism that uh, Sean's already touched on, people still have that belief that pr prices for things, especially clothing, should be a particular thing. Even if you're explaining that this is artisan made, it's really good for the planet, you know, it's all the, the cotton's been farmed indigenously and, and all of those kind of things. It's almost like, yeah, 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 but I still want it for 10 quid kind of thing. So that's, that is a real challenge. And it relates back to the first one. How do you get people to understand those impacts in a way that really makes them change what they're doing and change their expectation of what price is? And that isn't just consumers, actually, with the businesses we work with. We can have really long conversations with them and then they'll say, well, our current supplier charges us this and we expect to pay the same for you. So there's a whole big thing there around expectations. Uh, greenwashing is a key one as well, it, which is related. I'm sure Sean will talk about that, so I won't. Um, and yeah, I think it's that it's that um, difference between wanting to buy better but actually doing it. Um, the good news is we know that the ethical marketplace is growing, and it was up to 122 billion last year, which is a, a growth, which is great. However, there's loads of surveys showing that intention versus action, the figures are very different. When it comes down to it in the cold light of day, when you see that item um, and you go, oh my God, that's I'm not going to sp spend 30 quid on a scarf, however fair trade and beautiful and hand created and everything is, when I can get one down the shops for a, a fiver. So yeah, it's about, I suppose in the summary, it's about um, how do you make the message clear so that people will be understanding and learning and making decisions? And how do you make the understanding of prices be um, realistic with the impacts that are, are made from things? So that, that's basically my main challenge at the moment.
yeah i think i think one of the problems one of the challenges within that we've had within fair trade is obviously some things are considerably more expensive some things don't have to be like your coffee and your chocolate don't necessarily have to be that much more expensive but fashion in particular if you're going to do it right it's going to be more expensive and homewares to a certain extent as well um and it's that that how do you get to the point where people who understand that um, the importance of, of paying your artisans properly and, and making sure that they, uh, the, the cloth has been made in an ethical way um, and, and how do you sort of um, change the mindset from I'm not going to buy it at all to I'm going to buy if, if I think it comes down to if you if you have to buy something new understanding that you're going to have to pay enough for it to justify the, the length of time that you're going to have it and then when you hand it on to to someone else and hand it on to someone else that something's going to last i think that's fundamentally you're not paying five pound for something that's going to last a year you're paying 30 pound for something that's going to last you 10 years so it's better in a lot of ways um so sean we'll, we'll move on to, to you in terms of uh, talking about still talking about the challenges that uh, ethical businesses are facing in terms of campaigns and, and what, what, they're, what they're trying to achieve. I think that attitude behaviour gap is absolutely fundamental and you've all made some really good points there and it's just kind of acknowledging really that that attitude behaviour gap exists because those consumption habits are so ingrained in us at a subconscious level and they have been shaped and moulded by advertising for so many years so for me as a communication specialist it's about changing the environment around us rather than changing all our individual habits in order to achieve bigger change at scale at the, the pace that we need let's change the way that advertising works and fundamentally that comes down to the greenwashing and you've got outside of our echo chamber that I'm sure we're all in where we do know the true cost and we do know why you can get a t-shirt for five pounds on the high street and you know we know what goes on behind that but I think people don't necessarily always understand that or they choose not to dig in and understand that because then they would have to do something about their shopping habits and that can feel really really overwhelming to tackle and I think actually again it comes down to consumers not wanting that individual responsibility and really they shouldn't be the ones responsible for it it should fundamentally not be possible to create a t-shirt for five pounds so let's change that system and the only way we're going to do that realistically across the board is regulation now we know that regulation is really slow you know changing legislation making that happen is very slow takes a lot of lobbying and we're up against lobbying on the other side from the big oil companies and the companies that are profiting from the current system but actually we can take the businesses that are doing it in the right way and the consumers that are shopping in the right way and use that as the force to say this is how it should be done this is the voice for change and this this is where we want to get to and I think actually we spend a lot of time talking about and discussing that attitude behavior gap and how to move individual behavior to close that gap whereas actually if you change the system around why that gap exists in the first place that will fundamentally solve the problem. Yeah I suppose it's, it's a case of taking the responsibility away from the consumer and, and putting it onto the, the government to, um, to, to, to make sure that that you, you should we shouldn't have the choice to buy unethically um yeah that's true um one of the things that a lot of smaller social enterprises and even the big ones um we've talked about this sort of working collaboratively so i'm going to start uh, bring in the idea of, of working with partners and who who are we partnering with in order to get our, our message out uh, where are we going is it is it schools is it other businesses is it local authorities uh, those sorts of uh, uh, organizations um charities other social enterprises claire i'm going to move to you first so, so who are you partnering with and how are you um moving ch changing the dial with with other yeah, so obviously we sit within that sort of anti-poverty agenda. So we work very closely with a lot of anti-poverty charities. They tend to be national charities, so the likes of Turn to Us, the Children's Society, etc. There's quite a few of them. We, you know, we get involved in all sorts of campaigns. So we're now in a couple of poverty and destitution groups. Uh, Keep the Lifeline, the Universal Credit Club, was heavily involved in that. 
We do find some of these big national charities can be quite sort of protective of their space. So they're often very happy to use our research and our data. Occasionally, they even credit us for having produced it, but they can be sometimes reluctant to invite us to come along and present it ourselves. So that can be quite challenging because not only we are, are we a social enterprise, but we're Northern, which makes it even more, <laughs> even more difficult. Um, I find that I sort of, I basically push my way into as many groups and, and partnerships as I can. So I sit on the Grant Makers Alliance. That's the chief execs of all the major grants giving charities i'm a trustee of the reuse network which you know is a membership organization for furniture reuse charities um, and we work very closely with social landlords and local authorities so there are obviously there are those that we're lobbying to actually do something but those that, who are already sort of setting a high standard and are fantastic examples of best practice we work with them to, to sort of share their expertise to share their examples of what can and should be done um, so, you know, I think that's really important is to sh is to highlight and showcase the, the good practice to encourage those to, to follow in their in their footsteps. Um, we do work with local government, as I say, we do work with MPs. Sometimes they can, they're obviously very busy. They can sometimes be a bit forgetful about what they promised to do. But um, I think it's just about resilience, perseverance. And personally, I never turn down a meeting. I will always have a conversation with anyone because you never know where it might lead, no matter who it is. Um, so I'll always I'll talk to anyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's I think that's the important thing and just picking up on the northern thing uh, nobody on this call none, none of the six people that, that are uh, pinned are in London Kareem we're going to move to you now um, so who, who are you wh where are you working and, and, and who's helping you uh, sort of support the, your campaigns yeah so for us um, it's all about our books being true to life um, so with the first book being uh, My Mummy is an Engineer, it was um, quite easy because I work as an engineer and I, I kind of understood the issues that exist. You know, we were missing out on nearly 50% of the population because often women and girls thought that they, they couldn't be an, be an engineer. So um, we've actually worked, so we have eight books published now all around different um, industries and, and jobs. And for most of them, we've collaborated with large organizations, which has been great. So um, for example, we have um, My Mommy is a Soldier, which was uh, to celebrate um, 100 years of women in the army um, in the UK. Um, so, um, and, and a lot of the campaigns, are, are, or I guess the, the books that we launched tie in with campaigns that are happening. So the, the British army approached us for that and said, you know, we're having this, this big celebration, we wanna make, uh, make people aware that, you know, it's been 100 years of women in the army. Um, at that same time, it was when they'd um, announced that women could do all roles because, they, you know, women could only do certain roles um, within the army. So that was a, a big collaboration that we did with them. Um, we had our first daddy book, which was My Daddy is a Nurse, addressing issues of, um, you know, the, the misconceptions about who can do nursing and also the fact that there's a, a, a gap. Um, they need more men to, to be doing these, these types of roles. So we worked with the NHS on that, um, and that also tied in with the year of the nurse and midwife, which is which was about the time that um, COVID hit as well, which was um, quite a yeah strange time to be to be launching. But um, yeah, so we've had some quite quite um, good collaborations, and it's all with large organisations. So London Fire Brigade with my my mommy is a firefighter, and that's really important for us because we're so small that we don't have the reach that they do. So um, it, it's great when we have our book launch and, you know, they we get lots of media attention and so on. Um, going back to the challenges, though, it's how do we continue that once we've had a book launch to keep that to keep that going? Um, so, yeah, it's been important for us for, for the collaborations and, and trying to get the partnerships with the, the larger organisations. Yeah, brilliant. And I'm sure that eight, eight books is only the start. I'm sure there'll be plenty yeah, of them hopefully. as well. Uh, so, and Andy, who are you partnering with? I know you, obviously you've got connections with uh, the people that donate the, the items. Yeah, uh, we're partnering with quite a few people. And I guess it, it becomes challenging when, um, when actually what you believe is that tinkering with things is not enough, that we actually need system change. And that actually makes us a bit unpalatable to some people because, um, you know, some of what we're some of what we're campaigning on, what we're what we're pushing on, is actually to reduce consumption. Um, and you know, some of the people who want to partner with us are people who basically are driving consumption. 
And so that, that's kind of an interesting challenge for us and them on how we actually uh, find those organizations who are on the same wavelength as us um, and are kind of committed to things being changed in more than just a, well, this is a nice little campaign for us uh, and next year we'll move on to something else. Um, so, you know, you should always, I always think, choose your partners carefully. You know, you, you may be running on a small campaign, but it, it'll have, it, it may have impact for a lot longer than you want. And the people you get in bed with, you know, may have a, a, a bigger challenge for you. I was involved in the Fair Trade Foundation many, many years ago. And, you know, some of the challenges they're facing now are challenges that came about because the size of the people you want to partner and the impact you believe that might have becomes more important than uh, your short-term goals. And I think that can be a challenge. So I would say, yes, partnerships are good. We, we work with quite a few other organizations, but we choose our partners carefully and we always focus on those who are more aligned with us at the kind of like the, uh, the goal and vision level and not just at the uh, practical greenwashing, sorry, uh, kind of recycling level. Yeah, you seem to be nudging towards Nestle, which is, as some of you know, um, I uh, led the campaign to keep Kit Kat fair trade in uh, some of 2020, So, which is in, uh, I talk about that in Sean's book. Um, and yeah, I think that's that idea of partnering with somebody that you know is big enough to make a difference, but are they going to make you sort of water down your own your own principles that's a really really important tension in uh, in any anybody that's involved in in ethical uh, consume con consumption um so yeah joe who are who are your partners and you've mentioned a few sort of smaller organizations that you're also working with but um yeah who, who are you working with yeah i mean i think as, as a smaller um social enterprise i expect kareen can relate to this it's it's getting that message heard isn't it it's getting that message out there so reach is really important um so we collaborate really with um lots of other small businesses lots of other small social enterprises been part of shan's ethical hour since the start of that um organizations like bafts which you know very well joanna um school for social entrepreneurs um, all of those kind of things, organisation for responsible businesses, um, social enterprise UK. So we try to we try to collaborate with lots of other businesses that are trying to say similar messages, um, and that gives you that bigger reach, that bigger voice to get out there. Um, in the past, that's included events, and again, Sean and I've worked together on this, and I've worked with other people to try and run events, getting lots of small businesses together, get lots of people in there to see them and talk to them, and, and basically spread the message that way. Um, something similar to what Andy was talking about. I've tended to try and work with businesses that are wanting to use ethics for their own goals. And it does make, it can be a little bit complicated sometimes. So for example, um, where does it come from is currently on the NatWest uh, accelerator, business accelerator, and they have a climate accelerator and uh, as well as part of that, which is a really good as a way of, um, networking is one thing but also getting that voice out there so they've had me speak at various events and things like that but then you do get that slight concern are they using me and I think the answer is obviously yes they are using me so for example I was in their video for COP26 um, but basically extolling, extolling the virtues of NatWest Accelerator you know but it did give me a platform to speak on so I suppose there's an element of trying to use them as much as they use you but being really careful about it <laughs> makes if that makes sense and I suppose eBay in a way is a little bit like that that we we're working with a huge organization like eBay to try and get our products out there and reach a lot more people but we still want to be careful to have our own values and make sure that they align um, so that's one key one I think charity partners is also really important we work with quite a number of smaller charities Action Village India, Cardi London um, and other ones to, and bigger ones as well but to try to I don't know, collaborate, reach more more people through the different um, engines like email and newsletters and events and that kind of thing. And then another key one would be, of course, uh, existing campaigns, just um, as Karim was talking about. So for, for us, a big one is Fashion Revolution that comes around every April. So it's been important to be part part of that. You reach people, people, it might, it might 
reach people's consciousness if there's enough people saying the same kinds of messages in, in the same kinds of ways. So that's another key one. And then I think finally, a really important one is working with our suppliers because we work with a huge number of social enterprises, well, huge, but a number of social enterprises in India, in Africa, in the UK. And by sharing our audiences, mainly on social media, it's helping them as well, helping them in, get a better impact, but it's also educating people. It's, it's, it's that where does it come from message by sharing photographs and stories about the people who are actually involved in making things that might get into the subconscious and help with that behavior change. So lots of different types of collaboration is the short answer. Yeah, great. Uh, yeah, Sean, so um, the same sort of um, question in terms of um, who who are an important partners. Who do you see as as people that that it's useful to collaborate with um, in order to get out, get your message across? As a business community, we obviously foster a lot of collaboration within the community, and collaboration over competition is actually one of our founding values. And like Joe said, we've worked together on things like ethical brands for Fashion Revolution, um, having big events in London around Fashion Revolution Week. Uh, we organised the Be the Change Awards in 2019. Was it Joe? Pre-pandemic times, that's all a blur now, isn't it? In the uh, before times. <laughs> yeah, the before times, exactly. Uh, with the ethos of really, again, just, just showing how things can be. You know, awards programmes don't have to be pay to enter, pay to play. Win this award for your greenwashing. It can actually have more substance to it. So um, those kind of campaigns within the community to do exactly what Joe said, you know, many hands make light work. Let's work together and elevate our voices. Um, but then externally, we're now taking a three pronged approach. So we're looking at media, industry bodies and government. We've brought some lobbying expertise into the team. And uh, we're really looking now at how we can work with industry bodies like the CMA, the advertising standards industry, chartered institutes like CIPR and CIM, which are the uh, sort of chartered bodies for marketeers and, and PR professionals to really start to set a standard for um, anti-greenwashing legislation, which is starting to come, but again, is a slow process. And we really want to leverage the voices within our community and the expertise within our community to make sure we are contributing to that more than the big greenwashers are because you know they will be having their say on these issues so industry bodies as a way into government and doing that side of the lobbying and then the media as well so we've just launched our ethical news platform ethicalnews.org and we're trying to set that up as a space for really positive examples inspiring campaigns inspiring news stories tackling that eco anxiety tackling that idea that nothing is getting done and actually showing really practical solutions that are happening um, with the view that obviously if we are publishing it and we are pushing it out there that will then hopefully a be a resource for our members and this community wider to contribute to and to, to get their stories heard but then for the mainstream media to start looking to us for sources and expertise as well because we do a lot of that in a very soft way through the kind of PR contacts and things that we've made over the years you know we will pitch our members to press when we see call outs and things but we're trying to take a much more proactive approach now and really kind of push that out there and try and say don't look at that greenwashing that is greenwashing this is how it is actually done over here. Yes, yeah, so much of it's about empowering people to 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 call out when this when they see a, a larger company doing something. Um, I want to uh, to come to questions in in a few minutes, but I've just wanted to talk about the the final thing, which is I'm just wondering if if you feel that there's a tension between running a social enterprise as a profit making organisation and the, the campaigning that 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 we're doing. So I'm going to go to Claire first. You, you've touched on this a little bit because obviously the the campaigning arm of of uh, of FRC is is, um, is completely separate, pretty much. But uh, yeah. Yeah, so I, th I think I think we've covered that quite well with the independence of end furniture poverty, and I think you know we we demonstrate that clearly through conversations. I'll make that very quickly clear in conversations that we are independent and there's no sort of commercial reliance on orders or anything like that. 
initially when I thought about this question, I was thinking, not really, no, because, you know, the carrot is more powerful than the stick. We wouldn't criticise the social housing sector, for example, for not providing furnished tenancies, because I don't think that would be particularly productive. I don't think it would just annoy them and they're less likely to engage with us when it comes to sort of changing their behaviour and creating those furnished tenancies. Equally, of course, it would really annoy FRC because they're their customers and we, we could really, really upset them. Um, but I think there actually there is a bit of a tension for us because within our organisation, we're a double bottom line organisation, so commercial impact and social impact. Across the different social enterprises and charities in the group, it's very clear what the, what the financial return is of FRC. Uh, it's very clear the social impact of Bulky Bobs, which gives away free furniture, and we're very big on social impact measurement. What we've struggled to do is to measure the social impact of the campaigning side. And obviously the campaigning side has no financial return. So when it comes to, we have social value budgets and we base our financial budgets on the social value budgets and our board of trustees take that very seriously. So when it comes to fighting for resources within the organization and further investment in the campaigning side, I think we do lose out a little bit because you know the, the social impact is so hard to quantify and we don't have the financial return. So I think within that sort of profit-making side, that, that can be a bit of a tension. Maybe that's just internally, but I would imagine there's some similarities across other organisations like ours, which have the sort of the, the, the different remits. Okay, yeah, great. Um, Corinne, do you, do you see any tension with, uh, with, with the campaigning and the, um, and the profit-making side? Yeah, um, I guess similar to what Claire was saying as well. Um, like we we always try our best to scale, um, and we you know we put these ideas in place. Um, we've been uh, we've kind of approached various investors and had meetings with them. Um, we've come up with ideas to scale, um, which I think that's one of the questions that Chris has put in there as well. Um, but often the changes that are suggested kind of go against our social values. So it's how do you balance that? Um, and I think if we if we do try to scale, we have to be more creative in the way that we do it and not just the traditional way that kind of these investors are telling us to, to go about things. Um, I guess as an example, um, you know, with the pricing of the books, um, we want to try and get the books into as many schools as, as possible. Um, but there's, you know, lots of schools that can't afford that. And that's where we want the books to be. So we're thinking, oh, maybe we can approach um, local organisations to buy books to put into the schools, you know, so work in that way. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's, there's a tension there, definitely. Yeah, I'm sort of reminded of the uh, Buy a Stranger book, um, which happens on, on a Wednesday on Twitter, where people buy um buy books for well for, for schools but also for, for just individuals as a nice thing to do um yeah i'm generally in favor of of, um, of books in general um, and um do you fit do you see attention with the um with the profit making sort of imperative of a, of a social enterprise and uh, and the campaigning side yeah i mean i think there's there's a a tension throughout uh, all kinds of ethical business between uh, profits and uh, the campaigns you want to have because basically people will if you don't make enough money people will basically say get back in your box stop stop campaigning focus on making some money uh, and obviously if you make too much money then it's basically oh who are you to be selecting guys look at you you know lining your pockets and I think that is a real that is a real problem but um you know, we talked earlier on about fair price and people not understanding a fair price. People don't understand the price. You know, people actually don't. We actually ask individuals themselves and say to them, do you understand that when you buy this item, 20% of the price you're paying is going to the to government as VAT? No, I don't know. Is that right? Is that really? Are you sure? People don't actually understand the price. So if we try to explain what a fair price is, if we try to explain what a fair profit is, then I don't think that's really easy because people don't really understand what, what these terms actually mean. They're banded about all the time, but actually I think we're being let down uh, when we try and explain things because people don't have the, the basics of the understanding. So, you know, for us, we, we actually have, have stopped using the word profit now and we just use the word break even uh, because that seems to actually reduce the challenge. And we then, you know, use what we do uh, uh, to make sure we only break even by actually funding either charities or other initiatives or creating a safe space here where people can come and do things. So we, we have students and activists come and use our facilities for you know, banner making and preparing for events and that kind of stuff. And by doing that, we actually make sure that well, we end up breaking even rather than having uh, either money, to, money that we use we have to explain or money that we've made that we've got to explain. 
Yes. Uh, yeah, Joe, I, I think we've obviously touched on, on prices um, in, in, in previous conversations, but yeah, the, um, the tension between the, the fact that you're running a business and, 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 um, and your campaign um, is, is sort of encouraging people to, to maybe spend more than they think that they ought to. Yeah, I mean, the, the, key, the key tension in really for me personally is I'm trying to sell clothes to have positive impact and at the same time I'm telling people to buy less clothes so it always uh, it's always quite an interesting one um the way that I've I've tended to work with that is just to separate myself so um I used to hide a bit and it was all about where does it come from says but now I now have two Twitter accounts and two Instagram accounts so I can rant away as Joe Salter but I can also um have the more business storytelling kind of side I mean that's that's a jokey way of putting it but I have sort of managed to get on the stage as a speaker and things like that and put some of my thoughts out there about business models and ethical fashion and that kind of thing but the purpose of where does it come from is yes to educate people but it's also to have positive impacts for our workers and people's mental health and the environment as I said um, so that that's a, a key one um, I want to come on to growth which is well, as Chris has mentioned it, and I completely agree with what he's saying, because you can have a much bigger impact if you can grow the business. But as Corrine said, um, the difficulty with that is the expectation of how you grow. And that is a real a real challenge. So growing as a business obviously requires or often in quite requires investment or looking at different ways of doing things. One problem, um, again, which I think Andy referred to is that expectation that you won't make any margin or you won't make very much margin and so the point is to try and force that margin down force that price down or out as much as you can and it's trying to to justify the fact that in order to have an impact you need to grow and you need to make margin to cover your costs and all of that so I think there's a real tension there between the expectation that you won't be making any money but also that you you're going to have a positive impact so I think that's that's the, the two key things I would say so there's the gross margin challenge and there's the messaging you know buy less or buy from us yeah I, I remember um, working out uh, when I looked at the difference between the profit margin that theoretically I was making when I ran my social enterprise and what Amazon was making and I worked out that I would only be able to pay myself 12 pounds a year if I made as much margin as, as as Amazon did and of course they can because it's purely about uh, economies of scale so if you see a breakdown a lot of people will do this so this is the breakdown of a t-shirt or a cup of coffee or whatever and they see this 50 percent margin margin for the retailer but what they're not taking into account is all of the costs that the retailer's got and the fact that you might only be selling sort of a hundred of those things so you're not making a vast amount of money and and, and that percentage doesn't make any sense for a for a smaller organization um Sean, what's your experience in terms of, of, of ethical businesses and the um you know that the tension that, that we have between profit making and and campaigning and trying to change the world it's an interesting one for us because the crux of our mission is proving that good business can also be profitable. So we're trying to showcase that as much as possible. So we don't necessarily feel that tension, but we do feel it through our members in that they sometimes struggle to get wholesale orders because of those margins or struggle, like we said, to, to close that attitude behavior gap and actually get people to spend slightly more on their products. Where we're really seeing that play out though is in my other business, which is my communications agency we do a lot of investor relations work and there's a real mismatch at the moment in terms of education in the finance sector in that you've got lots and lots of challenger brands now coming through the pipeline that are ready to go for investment and are ready to scale up and are ready to secure that money but the people who have the money on the investment side don't fully understand ESG when it's actually applied to a business and what that does to your business model the fact that it's not just a series of tick boxes and then you operate like a standard normal business in air quotes um, that actually it really does affect the way that you grow um, it affects the decisions that you make and there might be certain deals and certain opportunities for example that you might turn down because they're not in alignment with your values but they would have been very profitable so I think we're kind of waiting now in the same way that for the last decade we've been waiting for consumers to catch up and, and the penny to drop we're now waiting for the finance industry to catch up the good thing is that it's happening a lot 
quicker because the consumer demand is there. Um, but that's been a really interesting one in the conversations we're having with brands that are ready to go for investment because it's a very personal decision about where will you take investment from? What are your kind of hard lines around that? And who should we go and talk to? And then doing that match up and finding them the right routes to finance, the right venture capitalists, the right people that have got the, the right attitude is a really interesting challenge that we're facing at the moment. Yeah, that's great. Um, I want to uh, thank everybody and we'll move on to, to questions. So if anybody's got a question, I'm just having a quick look through the, um, the chat. One of the um, suggestions is in terms of uh, poverty agenda about universal basic income. Um, I know, um, so does anybody want to, to come in on that? Do you want to either Claire or Andy in particular? Yeah, just quickly. Yeah, I think absolutely, totally agree. Um, there are some uh, universal basic income would be top of the list, but yes, affordable housing, uh, you know, adequately fairly paid work, uh, a decent adequate welfare safety net. These are all things that yes, we continue to work with those sort of bigger national charities alongside. But we have to be very conscious that right in here and now, we haven't got those things. So we're looking at those immediate. Uh, sticking plasters to furniture poverty and doing what we can to make them available and expand them and build upon them while then looking at some of the solutions to furniture poverty which in many cases is about a solution to poverty so yeah I totally agree with you Chris but it's a very uphill struggle isn't it do you feel oh, Andy yeah come in I was just going to say I think the thing for me is we're back to our system change issue aren't we and that fundamentally there's been no sensible debate on UBI in the UK because actually what gets portrayed in the media is basically handing out free cash to dossers to sit around doing nothing all day. And, you know, that that kind of pure level of the debate is going to prevent this from being properly researched, uh, trialled and rolled out. And so, again, we're back to system change. The system currently is not enabling us to have a, a sensible conversation where big issues can be tackled through really creative solutions, which is what UBI is. Um, and if you look in the States, you know, people like Andrew Yang are beginning to raise this and beginning to get the conversation started. But he's had to leave the Democratic Party to be able to do it because you know, the Democratic Party basically drummed him out for it. So it's, uh, you know, it's a tough one to get right. Indeed, yeah. Um, so one of the things that it was, um, well, obviously, it occurs to me that we need to change the government and the media before we can change those sorts of things. Do do we feel that um, obviously all of our campaigns are connected to other campaigns and, and to a certain extent to each other? Um, do you feel that sometimes we can be trying to do too much? Um, is it better to, to focus on, on, on one thing and get that right? We're always very conscious about avoiding mission creep. Um, that's something that we we very consciously focus on because, as I say, poverty is huge. Furniture poverty is big enough, but if 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 we if we creep and start looking at too many other things, we will lose our focus. We're the only organisation that focuses on furniture poverty, so we have to keep doing what we're doing. But equally, it would be crazy for us to ignore the fact that it's about poverty at the end of the day. So very conscious of it, but yeah. Sean, I know one of your what the, the um, things that um, come out in your book is this sense that campaigners can get too exhausted with trying to cover too many bases. Is that something you want to sort of expand on a bit now? Yeah, and I think there is that danger of getting burnt out by it and, and getting overly anxious at the scale of the issues and things like that. We see that a lot in climate at the moment. And I think it is, like you said, avoiding that mission creep, but then looking for those collaborations because all of these issues are intersectional. Who can you work with? And Claire, I know you said earlier about sometimes the bigger charities being territorial. You know, that comes from the, the funding landscape and that idea that there's scarce amounts of funding and things. But if you can get those collaborations going, they can be really powerful. And I think I obviously as a communications person I always come at it from a media sort of angle but if you're looking at it with your PR hat on the media likes really simple bite-sized digestible messages so how can you simplify that message down and sometimes the big system change the big intersectionality of all of it just is too overwhelming so simplify it down put people into their roles of what they're working on and then build those cross-sector collaborations where you can to elevate that message together I think is the most 
effective way of a getting the message out there and b avoiding that burnout of just taking the entire weight of the world onto your shoulders because I'm sure we've all been there I certainly have and it's absolutely exhausting and then you're no good to anyone if you're burnt out so you have to have that self-care as a as a foundation to it as well yeah, I think the, the analogy that I like is the idea that that uh, when you, the, the idea that you have to sort of put your mask on yourself before helping others, um, and it's genuinely just about that. Look, you've got you you are no good to anybody if you're burnt out. Um, so yeah, I always always like that. I, I'm not sure I always take it on board, but I do like that analogy. Um, so. I'm going to open up the uh, the floor to, to anybody else that's that's here just in, in the last couple of minutes. Does anybody have a comment or a question or a, a, anything that they, they wanted to say as part of the uh, this conversation? Um, I'm just going to jump back to your last point, actually, on uh, trying to cover too many too many areas. And um, we have this issue with the books um, uh, when we're working with, with other organisations as well, pointing out because the books are focused on gender bias. Um, but we have people, oh, can you, can you also cover, you know, dyslexia, race, disability, and so on, which is, um, we, we would love to be able to do as much as we can with the books, but then it kind of, yeah, it, it becomes too much. But, but a positive thing that we've got out of that, though, is, is just being aware of it. So when we're through the illustrations, for example, making sure that we have a diverse range of people um, throughout the book. So, so we can cover it in some way, but it, it does sometimes become a lot when you've got lots of people giving input and wanting to cover different things. Yeah. Yeah, that's brilliant so yeah we've gone past two o'clock so thank you so much to all of our panelists and thank you to everyone else who's come along um i'll be sending out a link to the recording uh, so you can watch this again if you want to or, um and uh yeah thank, thanks very much thank you thanks a lot joanna bye-bye thank you bye now bye